Hello, and uh, welcome to the Camden Public Library's weekly program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. This is our 125th program, so we have many of them on our website if you'd like to go back. My name is Joseph Cote, and I shall be your reader today. The potential in the phrase, my life flashed before my eyes, has always fascinated me. In February of 2022, the BBC claimed in a very important article and report that, quote, new data from a scientific accident has suggested that life may actually flash before our eyes as we die. The reported study published in Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience went on to say this. A team of scientists set out to measure the brain waves of an 87-year-old patient who had developed epilepsy. But during the neurological recording, he suffered a fatal heart attack, offering an unexpected recording of a dying brain. It revealed that in the 30 seconds before and after, the man's brain waves followed the same patterns as dreaming or recalling memories. Brain activity of this sort could suggest that a final recall of life may occur in a per person's last moments, the team wrote in their study. End of quote. The co-author of the study, University of Louisville neuroscientist Ajmal Zemar, noted that, quote, in the 30 seconds before the patient's heart stops supplying blood to the brain, his brain waves followed the same patterns as when we carry out high cognitive demanding tasks like concentrating, dreaming, or recalling memories, end quote. It continued 30 seconds after the patient's heart stopped beating, the point at which a patient is typically declared dead. This could possibly be a last recall of memories that we've experienced in life, and they replay through our brain in the last seconds before we die, end of quote. The study also raises questions, he said, about when exactly life ends, when the heart stops beating or the brain stops functioning. The BBC report ends with this statement from Dr. Semar. I think there's something mystical and spiritual about this whole near-death experience. And findings like this, it's a moment that scientists live for. End of quote. Hmm. All very interesting, surely provocative, and especially thought-provoking wildly expanding on this scientific process within the brain. Suppose that one could actually utilize that short time to accomplish something unexpected yet remarkable, like conjure the thought of writing a memoir and then going on to actually writing it posthumously. Wildly is the operative word, obviously, in that statement. Surely, you might think that I have finally gone off the deep end. Well, theoretically, not so, as evidenced by today's book in the spotlight. A few years back, well, quite a few years back, in 1880, Brazil's most celebrated writer, 
Joaquin Maria Machado de Assis, wrote what has often been lauded as a playful, incomparable masterpiece entitled The Posthumous Memoirs of Bras Cubas, Epitaph of a Small Winner. In it, the ghost of a decadent and disagreeable aristocrat decides to write his memoir. In his memoir, Bras Cubas, the wealthy 19th century Brazilian, examines from beyond the grave his rather undistinguished life in 160 short chapters that are filled with philosophical digressions and exuberant insights. A clear forerunner of Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Jorge Luis Borges, epitaph of a small winner is one of the wittiest self-portraits in literary history, as well as one of the masterpieces of Brazilian literature. That statement from the famed contemporary author, Salman Rushdie. But before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. Joaquin Maria Machado de Assis. One might well ask, what sort of a man would have the clever or absurd imagination to create such a tale? Let me begin with the original 1880 dedication written by the very hand of the very author through the very leading character Quote, to the first worm to gnaw the cold flesh of my corpse, I tenderly dedicate these posthumous memoirs. Quite a, a blinking light of caution ahead. The book's narrator adds on, quote, be aware that frankness is the prime virtue of a dead man. My dear living gentlemen and ladies, there's nothing as incommensurable as the disdain of the deceased. End quote. Well, Machado de Assis has certainly caught our attention. But allow me to back up and begin at the beginning briefly. Born in 1839, Rio de Janeiro, which was then the capital of the empire of Brazil. He was the son of a wall painter who himself was the son of freed slaves and a Portuguese washerwoman from the Azores. Obviously born into a poor family, he was the grandson of freed slaves in a country where slavery would not be fully abolished until 49 years later. He barely studied in public schools and never attended university. And yet, he taught himself a good deal on his own, even reaching beyond his native Portuguese to becoming multilingual with the addition of French, English, German, and Greek later in life. With only his own intellect and his dedication to self-education to rely on, he struggled to rise socially. To do so, he took several public positions, passing through the Ministry of Agriculture, Trade, and Public Works, and achieving early fame in newspapers, where he first published his poetry and chronicles. Machado's work shaped the realism movement in Brazil, where he first became known for his wit and his eye-opening critiques of society. 
He wrote five romantic novels, all of which garnered attention and success with the public, but literary critics considered them mediocre. Over time, Aziz rose to become a pioneer Brazilian novelist, poet, playwright, and short story writer, widely regarded as the greatest writer of Brazilian literature. In 1897, he founded and became the first president of the Brazilian Academy of Letters. Machado suffered repeated attacks of epilepsy, apparently related to hearing of the death of his dear old friend, Jose de Alençar. He was left melancholic, pessimistic, and fixed on death. His next book, The Posthumous Memoirs of Brás Cubas, grew to become widely considered his masterpiece. The translators of today's 2020 edition in the spotlight note, quote, at once a work of uproarious mockery and great sympathy, this is Machado de Assis at his most path-breaking. An incisive observer of the human condition, and a founding father of modernist fiction. Indeed, critics often note, quote, the mixed race grandson of ex-slaves, Machado de Assis is not only Brazil's most celebrated writer, but also a writer of world stature, who has been championed by the likes of Philip Roth, Susan Sontag, Allen Ginsberg, John Updike, and Salman Rushdie. Aziz died in Rio de Janeiro in 1908 at the age of 69. He was given a state funeral with full civil and military honors. Sadly though, Joaquim Maria Machado de Assis did not achieve widespread popularity outside Brazil during his lifetime. The posthumous memoirs of Brás Cubas, epitaph of a small winner. Quote, I passed away at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday in August in 1869 in my beautiful mansion in the Katumbai district of the city of Rio de Janeiro, end quote. So begins Machado de Assis's The Posthumous Memoirs of Blas Cubas, told eerily from beyond the grave. Supposedly, this remarkably experimental novel was never intended by its author to be a popular run-of-the-mill novel. And yet, it was Parul Segal of the New York Times who referenced today's 2020 translation with the question, quote, is it possible that the most modern, most startlingly avant-garde novel to appear this year of 2020 was originally published in 1880? If indeed the idea of writing a memoir sprung into the mind of the character Bras Kubas in that 30 seconds before his brain died, he surely carried on with great alacrity to compose 160 short, some very short, scenarios of his life. He narrates his life story, admittedly glibly, quote, I am not so much a writer who has died as a dear man who has decided to write. His life is relayed out of order, beginning with his funeral and then stepping back to offer, quote, a brief genealogical sketch. 
as the translators themselves note, quote, an enigmatic, amusing, and frequently insufferable anti-hero, Cubas describes his childhood spent tormenting household servants and meddling cheekily in adult affairs. Through his bachelor years, navigating his own torrid affairs, up to his final days, obsessing over nonsensical poultices. End quote. Oddly, the final chapter is all negatives. I did not achieve fame through my poultice. I did not become a government minister. I never married. I did not die a lonely death, nor suffer semi-madness. I did not have children, and thus did not bequeath to any creature the legacy of our mystery. Despite all this negativity, the posthumous memoirs of Ross Kubas, written from beyond the grave by a most curious method, is inscribed, quote, with the pen of mirth and the ink of melancholy. Fascinating, eh? In my humble opinion, the posthumous memoirs of Ross Kubas came to our attention by a frequent listener to our program, a woman identified only as Miss Baseball. I think a fan. I don't think I ever, ever would have found this unique post-mortem novel otherwise. So thank you, Ms. Baseball. As popular no uh, novelist Philip Roth once wrote about the author, quote, a great ironist, a tragic comedian. In his books, in their most comic moments, he underlines the suffering of making us laugh. End quote. Echoes from The Economist, quote, sprinkled with epigrams, dreams, gags, and asides, the story teases, dances, and delights. I enjoy reading the book immensely and <laughs> strongly recommend it. It could not be any more unique, someone writing their memoirs from the grave. I'm going to start a reading uh, from the introduction by the translators. By the way, the book has been translated several times uh, since 1880. Uh, this is the most recent one, 2020. And I, I just want to give you from their vantage point, having translated the book, uh, and then we'll compare that to the, um, the note to the reader, uh, which is written by the character Bras Kubas. So let's see what the translators say, and then let's see what Bras says, and then we'll go on in um, to what Joachim wrote. So this is the last paragraph of, of, of uh, the translator's introduction. No one escapes Machado's scathing view of humanity, which is ruled by greed and ambition and egotism. From his position beyond the grave, Bras Cubas is free at last to be totally honest about himself and about others, to write, as he himself says, quote, with the pen of mirthful mockery and the ink of melancholy. Perhaps the only moment of unmediated emotion comes with the death of Bras Kubas's mother and Bras Kubas's apparently genuine grief, from which, however, he recovers very quickly indeed, as if grief were just another obstacle to him having fun. The book is a catalog of failures. Ras Kubas fails to marry, fails to produce his anti-melancholia poultice, fails to become a government minister or a newspaper publisher.
the shirt. Lobo Neves fails to become a minister, let alone a marquis. Eugenia fails to marry anyone. Eulalia fails to rise in the world, fails even to live past 17. And Quincas Borba fails to publish his book of philosophy and doesn't even manage to be totally insane. Machado presents us with an almost entirely nihilistic view of life and humanity. And yet, narrator and novel draw us in because the narrative voice is so beguiling, so funny, often outrageous, and always utterly frank. And so we perhaps recognize our own flawed selves in the narrator and the other characters. And is that perhaps the question the novel is asking the reader? That from the translator. Interesting, very, very interesting. I should mention the translator's name. It's appropriate, isn't it? Margaret Joule, J-U-L-L, Costa, and Robin Patterson. Now, this is a note to the reader from the original book, 1880, um, and it's the narrator speaking, not the author, but the narrator. It says, Stendhal's confession that he wrote one of his books for a mere hundred readers is a cause of astonishment and consternation. It would, however, cause neither astonishment nor indeed consternation if this book failed to find even Stendhal's readership of 100 or indeed 50 or 20 or at most 10, 10, perhaps five. True, it is a somewhat rambling book and although I, Brass Cubas, may well have adopted the free form of a Stern or a Xavier de Maistre, I have added a little petulant pessimism of my own. Why not? This is, after all, the work of a dead man. I wrote it with the pen of mirthful mockery in the ink of melancholy, and it is not hard to foresee what would result from such a marriage. Serious people will doubtless feel that the book bears all the hallmarks of a run-of-the-mill novel, while frivolous people will fail to find any of the qualities they have come to expect in a novel. It will thus win neither the respect of the serious nor the love of the frivolous, the two main pillars of popular opinion. I hope, nonetheless, to win the sympathy of said popular opinion and the best way to do so would be to avoid writing a long, over-explicit prologue. The best prologue is the one that contains the fewest ideas or sets them out in obscure, truncated form. I will, therefore, say nothing of the extraordinary method I employed when composing these memoirs written here in the next world. That would be intriguing, but would take far too long. And besides, would add nothing to the reader's understanding of the book. The book is sufficient unto itself. If you like it, dear reader, uh, that is reward enough. If you do not, I reward you with a dismissive snap of my fingers and bid you good riddance. We heard the voices of the translator and the voices of the character, the narrator. Let's see what the writer has to say. <laughs> Excuse me. We'll start with chapter one. And as I mentioned, they're quite brief. I'll let you know as we change chapters. We start with one appropriately called Death of the Author. For some time, I could not decide whether to begin these memoirs at the beginning or at the end. That is, whether I should start with my birth or my death. 
Since the usual approach is to begin with one's birth, two considerations led me to adopt a different method. Firstly, I am not so much a writer who has died as a dead man who has decided to write and for whom the grave proved to be another cradle. The second is that this approach will make what I write seem more elegant and more modern. Moses, who also described his own death, did so not at the outset, but at the end. A radical difference between this book and the Pentateuch. That said, I passed away at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday in August in 1869 in my beautiful mansion in the Katumbai district of the city. I was in my 64th year, so robust and prosperous, a bachelor possessed of some 300 contos and accompanied to the cemetery by just 11 friends. 11 friends, true. No invitations had been sent, no obituaries published. I should also add that it was raining, drizzling, a fine, sad, constant rain, so sad and so constant that it led one of those faithful few to weave this ingenious idea into the address he gave at the web at the graveside, quote. You sirs who knew him can say with me that nature itself seems to be mourning the irre irreparable loss of one of the finest men ever to grace humanity with his presence. This somber air, these drops from heaven, these dark clouds covering the blue with a funereal veil, all this is evidence of the terrible, raw grief gnawing at the very bowels of nature. All this speaks in sublime praise of our illustrious and dear departed friend. Oh, good and faithful friend. No, I certainly don't regret the 20 government bonds I left to him. And thus it was that I reached the close of my days. Thus it was that I set up for Hamlet's, quote, undiscovered country, with none of the young prince's yearnings and doubts, but as slowly and as steadily as someone returning home late from the theater. Late and feeling somewhat grumpy. Around nine or 10 people came to see me off, among them three ladies, my sister, Sabina, married to Cottrum, and their daughter, a real lily of the valley. And, but patience, I will tell you shortly who the third lady was. Suffice it to say that although unrelated to me, this nameless person suffered more than any of my actual relatives. It's true, she really did. I'm not saying she tore her hair out. I'm not saying she writhed about on the ground. Besides, I did not actually die a dramatic death. A bachelor who breathes his last at the age of 64 is hardly the stuff of tragedy. And so it wouldn't really have been right for that anonymous lady to behave as if it were. Standing at the head of my bed, her eyes wide, her lips parted, the sad lady could barely comprehend that I was gone. Dead, dead, she was saying to herself. And like the storks seen by an illustrious traveler as they took flight from the Ilosos River for the shores of Africa, indifferent both to the ruins below and no time, her imagination likewise took flight over those present day ruins for the shore of the Africa of her youth. But let her go. We will follow later when I return to my younger self. Now, I wish to die peacefully, methodically, 
listening to the ladies sobbing and men quickly talking, the rain drumming on the caladium leaves in the garden, and the grating noise made by a grinder sharpening a knife outside a chainmaker's forge. I can assure you that this orchestra of death was not as sad as it might seem. At a certain point later on, it became almost delicious. Life was struggling for survival in my breast, like a series of breaking waves. My consciousness was fading. I was slipping into physical and moral stasis, and my body was turning me into plant, stone, mud, nothing. I died of pneumonia, but if I tell you, the reader, that the cause of my death wasn't so much pneumonia as a grandiose and futile idea, you might not believe me, and yet it's true. I will briefly set out the facts. Judge for yourself. Chapter two. The poultice. So, one morning, while I was strolling in the garden, an idea appeared on the trapeze I have inside my head. Once there, it began to fling its arms and legs about, performing the most daring acrobatics imaginable. I simply watched, transfixed. Suddenly, it made a huge leap, stretching out arms and legs to make an X. Either decipher me or I will eat you up. That idea was neither more nor less than the invention of a truly sublime remedy, an anti-melancholia poultice, intended as a salve for our melancholy humanity. In my application to present this invention, I drew the government's attention to this truly Christian solution. I did not, on the other hand, deny to my friends the pecuniary advantages that could accrue from the distribution of a product with such profound effects. However, now that I am here on the other side of life, I can confess everything. What really attracted me was the pleasure it would give me to see in newspapers on shop counters, in pamphlets, and on street corners, and of course, on the actual boxes containing the remedy. These four words, the bras cubas poultice. Why deny it? I was obsessed with public acclaim, posters, and pyrotechnics. More modest people might condemn that as a fault. I trust, though, that the more astute Will knowledge it as a gift. My idea then had two sides to it, like a medal. One turned to the public, the other to me. On the one side, philanthropy and profit. On the other, a thirst for fame, or shall we call it a love of glory. An uncle of mine, a canon, used to say that love of temporal glory was the perdition of the soul, which should yearn only for eternal glory. To which another uncle, an officer in one of our oldest infantry regiments, would retort that the love of glory was man's most truly human quality and therefore his most genuine feature. I leave it to the reader to decide who was right, the soldier? or the cannon. I, meanwhile, return to my poultice. Chapter three, genealogy. But now that I've mentioned my two uncles, allow me to draw you a brief genealogical sketch. The founder of my family was a certain Damayo Cubas, who flourished in the first half of the 18th century. He was, both by name and by trade, a maker of barrels, or cubas. Born in Rio de Janeiro, he would have died in poverty and obscurity had he restricted his activities to barrel making. But no, he became a farmer, 
planting and harvesting and exchanging his produce for good, honest cash until he died, leaving his considerable fortune to a highly educated son, Luis Tubas. It is with this young man that my ancestral line really begins. The ancestors, that is, uh, to which my family would happily admit. Because Damiao Cubas was, after all, a mere barrel maker, possibly not even a very good one. Whereas Luis Cubas had studied at Coimbra University, risen to a prominent position in government, and become a close personal friend of the Viceroy, the Conde de Cunha. Since the surname Cubas had rather too much of a whiff of barrel making about it, my father, great grandson of Damiao, claimed that the name Cubas had been bestowed on a nobleman, a hero of Portugal's exploits in Africa, as a reward for capturing 300 Cubas, or Cuba sanctuaries, from the Moors. My father was an imaginative fellow and escaped from the barrel making shop on the wings of pun. He was a decent man, my father, and more dignified and loyal than most. True, he was not without a touch of vanity, but then who in this world is not? I, I should point out that the only resort, he only resorted to invention having first tried fabrication. For he had initially attached himself to the family of my famous namesake, Bras Cubas, the founder and governor of Sao Vicente, the town where he died in 1592, and who was, moreover, the reason my father christened me Bras. The governor's family, however, roundly denied any such connection. And it was then that my father came up with those 300 imaginary Moorish Cubas. Some members of my family are still alive. My niece, Venancia, for example, that pure lily of the valley, the very flower of all the women of her day. Her father is still alive too, yes, a man who, but let us not anticipate events. Let us have done, once and for all, with our cultists. Chapter four, the idée fixe. After performing all these somersaults, my idea had become an idée fixe. May God defend you, dear reader, from an idée fixe, better a moat in your eye, better a beam. Think only of Cavoir. His idée fixe is a united Italy, and it eventually killed him. Bismarck's idée fixe did not kill him, of course, but then nature is such a capricious creature and history is ever better stumpage. Suetonius, for example, gave us a Claudius, who is a simpleton, or as Seneca called him, a pumpkin, and a Titus, who is the delight and darling of Rome, a professor recently found a way of demonstrating that of the two seasons, the true delight and darling was actually Seneca's pumpkin. And you, Madame Lucretia, the flower of the Borgia family, whom one poet described as a Catholic Messalina, you were saved by a skeptical German historian, Ferdinand Gregorovius, who did much to mitigate that view. And while you may not have emerged as a pure white lily, neither were you a bog. I sit midway between the poet and the historian. Long live history then, the fickle history that can be put to any use. But to return to the idée fixe, I would say that out of such ideas come strong men and maniacs while out of vague, shifting, mutable ideas come Claudius's, a la Suetonius. My idea fix was a very fixed idea indeed, as fixed as, well, I can't think of anything in the world that is quite as fixed, but perhaps the moon, perhaps 
the pyramids of Egypt. Perhaps Germany's dear departed Confederate diet. Let the reader choose the comparison that suits him best. And don't get all stiffy with me just because we haven't yet reached the narrative part of these memoirs. We will. Like most other readers, your confrères, I think I too prefer anecdote to reflection and believe I'm right to do so. We will get there. Like most other readers, I should, though, warn you that this book is written in a leisurely fashion, as befits a man no longer troubled by the swift passage of time. It is an extremely philosophical work, although its philosophy is somewhat uneven, one moment austere, the next playful, a work that neither builds nor destroys, neither inflames nor chills, and which is more pastime than doctrine. So <clears throat> let us begin. Stop your sniffing and let us get back to that cultus and forget all about history, which can be as capricious as any elegant society lady. None of us fought in the Battle of Salami. None of us wrote the Augsburg Confession. And for my part, if my thoughts ever do turn to Cromwell, it's only because I enjoy imagining that the same royal hand that dissolved Parliament could well have imposed the brass cubas pultus on the entire English population. But don't laugh at this twin triumph of pharmacy and puritanism. As we all know, beside every large flamboyant public flag, there are often various other modestly private flags, which are hoisted up to flutter in the other flag's shadow, and which, quite often, outlive it. To offer a rather poor analogy, it is like the rabble who once sought shelter within the walls of the feudal castle. The castle fell, and the rabble remained. Admittedly, the rabble then grew in power and themselves became the kings of the castle. Now, it's not a good analogy at all. Chapter 5, in which a lady's ear appears. Alas, when I was busy preparing and perfecting my invention, I happened to sit in a cold draft and immediately fell ill, but failed to take proper care of myself. I had that poultice stuck in my head. I was carrying around that idée fix about the mad and the strong. I could see myself as if from afar, rising up above all hordes and into the sky like an immortal eagle. And in the face of such a lofty spectacle, a man cannot feel the pain afflicting him. The next day, I was feeling even worse, and I did finally attend to myself, but half-heartedly, unmethodically, unmetho carelessly, and inconsistently. And that is the origin of the illness that brought me to eternity. As you already know, I died on a Friday an unfortunate day on which to die, and as I think I've established, it was my invention that killed me. Less lucid proofs than mine have met with triumphant cheers. However, it was still not impossible that I would climb to the very summit of the century and appear in the newspapers among other Methuselahs. I was strong and healthy, Imagine if, instead of laying the foundations of the pharmaceutical invention, I had been trying to piece together the elements of a political institution or a religious reform. Then along came that cold draft, which outdid its efficiency all our human plans, and that was that. Thus is the fate of all mankind. With that thought, I bade farewell to the woman who, while she was not, I would say, the most discreet, 
was certainly the most beautiful of all her contemporaries. The unnamed lady from the first chapter, the one whose imagination took flight like those storks by the Elisos River. But then she was 54 years old, a ruin, but a very imposing one. Imagine, dear reader, that she and I had loved other, each other many years before, and that one day as I lay on my sickbed, I saw her appear at my bedroom door. We have one more time. Now, this one is in French, chapter six. Chemin que le dit, que le dit, Rodrigue, que le cru. I saw her appear at the bedroom door, pale, tearful, all in black, and watched her linger there for a whole minute, unable to summon up the, the courage, summon up the courage to come in or perhaps deterred by the presence of the other man who was in the room at the time. I observed her closely from the bed where I lay, and it did not even occur to me to speak or make some gesture. We had not seen each other for two years, and I was seeing her not as she was now, but as she had been, as we both had been, because some mysterious Hezekiah had made the sun turn back to the days of our youth. The sun turned back and all my woes fell away. And this handful of dust, which death was about to scatter into the eternal void, outdid time itself, death's minister. Not even a drop of Juventus's rejuvenating water could match the sweet allure of the past. Believe me, remembering is the lesser evil, for no one can trust in present day happiness, which always contains a little of Cain's spittle. One time, once time has passed and the spasm is over, Perhaps then you can truly enjoy it, because if you have to choose between those two illusions, choose the one you can savor without pain. This evocation of lost joys proved short-lived because reality soon prevailed, and the present drove out the past. Later, in some small corner of this book, I will perhaps regale the reader with my theory of human additions. All you need to know now, though, is that Virgilia, for that was her name, entered the room with a firm step, with the gravity bestowed on her by her clothes and the years, and walked over to the bed. The stranger got up and left. He was someone who visited me every day to speak of the exchange rate, colonization, and the need to develop the railways. What could possibly be of more interest to a dying man? He left, but Julia remained standing, and for some times we gazed at each other without speaking. Who would have thought it? Twenty years on, all that was left of two great lovers, of two unbridled passion, were two withered hearts, ravaged by and satiated with love and life. Whether in equal measure, I cannot say, but definitely satiated. Virgilia now possessed the beauty of old age, an austere maternal look. She wasn't as thin as when I saw her for the last time at a St. John's Eve festival in Chukawaka, and because she was the sort to fend off old age for as long as possible. Only now were a few silver threads beginning to appear in her dark hair. Have you taken to visiting the dead? I asked. What do you mean, the dead? Answered Virgilia, tuttering. Then she squeezed my hands. I've simply come to see if I can make these lazy bones get out of bed and into the street again. 
Her voice no longer had the same caressing, lachrymose tone of yesteryear, but it was nonetheless tender and sweet. She sat down. Since I was alone in the house, apart from a male nurse, we could speak freely. Virgilia gave me a long account of life outside. And she did so in a witty, slightly waspish manner that lent a certain piquancy to her words. Ready as I was to depart this world, I took a satanic pleasure in mocking it, in persuading myself that what I was leaving behind really wasn't anything worth having. Oh, come now, Virgilia interrupted me somewhat angrily. If you're not careful, I won't come and see you again. What do you mean, die? We all have to die. Being alive is a guarantee of that. And then looking at the clock, she said, Oh, goodness, it's three o'clock. I must be going. Already? Yes, already. But I'll come back tomorrow or the day after. I'm not sure that would be pro proper, I retorted. The patient is a bachelor and there are no ladies in the house. What about your sister? She's coming to spend a few days here, but won't arrive until Saturday. Virgilia thought for a moment. Then she shrugged and said gravely, Oh, I'm an old woman now. No one takes any notice of me anymore. But just in case, I'll bring Nonho. Nonho was a law graduate, her only son, who at the age of five, had been unwittingly the accomplice to our love. They both came to see me two days later, and I confess that when I saw them there in my bedroom, I felt so overcome by shyness that at first I felt unable to respond to the young man's kind words of greeting. Virgilia noticed this and said to her son, Nono, take no notice of this old friend. He won't say anything because he wants you to believe he's at death's door. Nano smiled, and I think I smiled too, and we all laughed. But Julia was bright and serene, like one who has led a spotless life. No suspect looks, no telltale gestures. Instead, a perfect equilibrium between word and mind. A degree of self-control that seemed, and perhaps was, remarkable. When we happened to touch on some illicit love affair, which was half secret and half public knowledge, I watched her speak with scorn and even indignation about the woman involved, who was, besides, a friend of hers. Her son was pleased to hear her hold forth with such force and dignity, and I wondered to myself what the sparrow hawks would have to say about us but Buffon then born a sparrow hawk. This was the beginning of my delirium. Well, the chapters follow from there in reverse order, obviously. We are now at the delirium stage, which is the next chapter. And of course, they continue to go back in time um, all the way through to his young days. Reason versus folly transition on that day the child is father of the man meaning the death of his father there uh, to which he cares for uh, an episode from 1814 so we're going back in time to the very end uh, when he's uh, just a young man a very young man a child actually anyway as you can see the style of the book is very conversational and very uh, very natural very relaxed um, and humorous. <laughs> if we keep reminding ourselves that the poor man is dead, um, and he's quite humorous for a dead man, don't you think? <laughs> anyway, I would suggest you catch it at one of the libraries. It's very, it's obviously very unique, um, uh, reverse order. The Posthumous Memoirs of Bras Kubas, published first of all in 1880 and the most recent um, um, translation by Margaret Joel Costa and Robert Patterson of 2020. Thus today's book and a tad bit of humor there. 
I'd like to tell you a little bit about next week's book before we hang up here. Um, it's arrived in the mail. It's particularly large. <laughs> so I must start reading immediately. It is, book, it is called The Myth of Normal. It's a new book published just in 2023, already this year, The Myth of Normal. And the subtitle is really the clincher, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. It's obviously a very contemporary work of nonfiction. Uh, it's, of course, the New York Times bestseller, which is why I couldn't get it through the public library system anywhere in the state of Maine. Uh, there are several copies, but they're all checked out for the next several weeks. So I've had to buy it, which is just fine. It's by the acclaimed author of the book Realm of Hungry Ghosts, a groundbreaking investigation into the causes of illness. A bracing critique of how our, our society breeds disease and a pathway to health and healing. Well, that's certainly food for thought, isn't it? In this revolutionary book, renowned physician Gabor Mate eloquently dissects how in Western countries that pride themselves on their healthcare systems, Chronic illness and general ill health are on the rise. Nearly 70% of Americans are on at least one prescription drug. More than half take two. In Canada, every fifth person has high blood pressure. In Europe, hypertension is diagnosed in more than 30% of the population. And everywhere, adolescent mental illness is on the rise. So what is really normal when it comes to health? For all our expertise in technological sophistication, Western medicine often fails to treat the whole person in ignoring how today's culture stresses the body burdens the immune system, and undermines emotional balance. Now Mate brings his perspective to the great untangling of common myths about what makes us sick, connects the dots between the maladies of individuals and the declining soundness of society and offers a compassionate guide for health and healing. Well, if for no reason that you can think of other than the phrase toxic culture, I think it's worth joining me next week. Toxic culture, trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. The Myth of Normal by Gabor Mate published only a month ago. It is the hot New York Times bestseller at the moment. So get ahead of your friends. <laughs> Come visit me next week <laughs> and hear about the book so that you can be the first to talk about it at your next cocktail party. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed uh, the book. It's such a unique book. I know I've used that word too many times, but it's such a unique book. <laughs> I suggest you read it. And if you did enjoy it uh, in today's program, please hit that little icon there called thumbs up, thumb pointing to the air. Uh, maybe you would even consider sharing it with a friend. Uh, also, please do leave a comment either about the author or the book, the concept, um, any anything at all, and perhaps your favorite book, uh, so that we might consider it as we consider it and look captured this book today from Ms. Baseball, her email address. I also encourage you to subscribe uh, to the Camden Public Library's program's YouTube channel, uh, just to stay on top of the great programming that happens and unfolds on a regular basis at the Camden Public Library. 
the icon is right there with the word subscribe on it. You can't miss it. It also is a vote of confidence for us, and it keeps us in the number one spot statewide with the most YouTube channel subscribers for a library's programming division. And that is small libraries, big libraries, medium-sized libraries. So the Camden Public Library is number one in the state of Maine, going on the eighth month now. So we're very pleased with that. So hit the subscribe. It'll only ask for your email address, which will send you information about upcoming programs like this one. Thanks again for joining me. Um, and uh, uh, Marcio uh, de Assis, Marcio. Oh, it was a very interesting day, I think. Take care of yourself as spring continues to unfold. The weather is very, very, very promising these days. And the daffodils are as bright yellow as they were last year. So enjoy early spring as the buds come on and the pollen level rises. Take care of yourself health-wise. And above all, try hard to be happy. Thank you very much. Goodbye.